Jacob, very, very nice to see you for the very first time. Um, will we be talking to each other? And I remember reading your name for the very first time, probably almost, I don't know, almost 25 years ago, I would say, probably not mid 90s or uh, when, when we were both um, associated with a DGM and you had, right. you had an album there, right? That's right. Um, I think the first album with them was about 1998 for me. Okay, yeah. If I remember rightly. And, and yes, over the years we've exchanged plenty of messages, but uh, this is the first time we actually speak to each other, so better late than never, I suppose. Oh, it's wonderful. And uh, I had no, you know, I'm like one of these people who, who really doesn't think about what I imagine the other person uh, is like, or, you know, uh, sounds like. And like, your voice really is uh, it's surprising now. It's, huh. it's, it's, uh, it's very nice. <laughs> you too, you too. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like back then, um, I had a band called Europa String Choir, which, you know, we recorded an album around 98, I think it was, which was then later put out in 2000 on, on Rob Fripp's DGM. And uh, do you still remember the, did you do two albums for DGM? I did two albums, yes. Uh, um, do, you, do you remember the titles? <laughs> the first one was called Black Cow, mm -hmm. which was uh, a disc of Eastern European uh, 16th century lute music which was a bit of a departure for Robert, mm -hmm. but he, um, he very kindly um, decided to take it on. And then a couple of years later, I did a, um, a volume of arrangements for lute of music by Georges Candé Pré. So again, 16th century music, late 15th even, some of it. Um, and that was, uh, I think, 2000, two, two years following, or 2001. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, how did you um, meet David Singleton and, and Robert? That was um, an interesting story. I had been a fan of Robert's guitar playing since my teenage years. Um, I actually came to his playing through his solo album and through the Discipline album. Mm -hmm. um, and then I worked backwards and worked forwards from there, mm -hmm. um, as I think probably lots of people have done. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, let's see, when Discipline came out, I would have been about 16, I think. Um, so after I did my first solo album, which was for a UK label, and that was a disc of English music, Elizabethan music, um, about 1997, I thought, um, I'm going to send him a copy. And actually, you may not believe me, but I genuinely <laughs> had no ulterior motive. I just thought, I very much appreciate the music that he makes, and I very much appreciate everything I've learned from him indirectly, as it were, because we'd never encountered him mm -hmm. in this disc. Uh, and much to my amazement, a few weeks later, he rang me up and said, your disc comes at a good time. I want to expand and look at, um, look at some classical music for the label, and I want to call it the Present Moment series. So that was the beginning of the Present Moment series. Um, and I was over the moon, of course, and went to um, down to Wiltshire to meet Robert and David. And that was my first encounter with them. We ended up recording the album in a local church, mm -hmm. just up the road from where... In, in Broad Church or...? Uh, I think Broad possibly, Shop, I think it was called. Possibly yeah. the next village, which might have been called... Eb, Ebbs, something with Ebbs. Ebbsbourne Wake, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I should have looked that up. It's something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yes, that that was um, the beginning of it all. That's that's an incredible story, really. Like it's it's that's the that's the dream come true kind of story, right? You're you're sending one disc and you're actually getting a response. So it's 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 what usually never happens. That's right. That's right. Especially when you don't expect it. Maybe that's the key: not to expect anything. <laughs> oh, that is the key. That is the key. It's not not to expect and not to want anything. I think yeah. that's the key. <laughs> yeah. I was, um, I was genuinely just doing it out of appreciation, and mm -hmm. thinking, I wonder if he knows anything about lute music. I think he might like this, and um, so yeah, it was a real gift actually to receive that phone call. And it was very funny also because when the call came, I was speaking on the other phone line, 
to John Taylor, who's the, the wonderful re record producer and engineer who did my first album. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about something, I can't remember what. And the other line rang and Susanna, my wife, picked it up and said, oh, you've got a call. And I said, um, I'll call back. I'm talking to John. And she said, <laughs> it's. <laughs> I said, oh, John, I'll call you back. Bye. <laughs> I put the phone down, picked up the other phone, and there was Rob. I had no idea. That's that's an incredible story, really. It really is. So around that time you were, yeah, I mean, you were 30, right? Uh, I was born Early. in 64, so I was 34 or so, yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah. When when did you, well, probably start, you started playing early, right? Well, I, I, I played the guitar from six. six uh, so, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's another funny story, because apparently when I was four, I put rubber bands on a shoebox and made my <laughs> own guitar <laughs> and sang. Mm -hmm. And then finally, when I was six, my parents decided, you know, this person really does have to play a plucked instrument. He, he's... He's obsessed. <laughs> so they got me a guitar. Um, I didn't touch a lute until I was 22. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and my guitar playing was mainly self-taught. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of classical guitar and I played various, you know, tried out various other kinds of guitar playing, made up some music of my own. Um, but when I found the lute, that was sort of a, a big moment because it was moving from being passionate about the guitar to being something even more than that about the lute, because that was where my love of plucked instruments and and something about that music sort of came together to interact. And um, yeah. a, a path suddenly appeared before me, really. So it was was a nylon string guitar that your parents bought you? Yeah. 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 Actually, possibly at the beginning, it might have been, my very first one might have been steel strung, I can't remember. I had some lessons as a small child with them a folk singer and she mm -hmm. taught me a few songs and a few chords and then I at some point a few years later had a few classical guitar lessons and then I took it from there and, and sort of trained myself mainly um, which I think is pretty unusual in the classical world you know to be self-taught but I was sort of quite good at at, um, at listening to myself in a dispassionate sort of way and um, evaluating where I was and where I was going, and the one weak point was um, not having any sort of technical tips or tricks. I had to work all that out for myself, and sometimes it's helpful to get a bit of help. Um, but that all came later when I switched to the lute. Uh, that's that's very interesting. So, do you have any? Do you recall what it felt like to play before you had any sort of awareness of the technical aspects of playing? Was there, yeah, that yeah, that's an interesting question because um, I think I had something then, which I don't have now, which mm -hmm. was a sort of naturalness. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're children, you must have experienced this too. When we learn something as a child, we absorb it sort of like a sponge, don't we? Mm -hmm. It's a bit like learning a language without making any effort, um, and. The guitar became a part of me. It became sort of like an extension of myself. And I've never had that with the lute, even though I've been playing the lute now for um, 34 years. Mm -hmm. um, it, feel, it doesn't feel like a part of me in the same way, simply because it was a skill I acquired as an adult, whereas the guitar was a skill I acquired as a child. And for me, there's a difference. It's like learning a new language as an adult. It's a real effort. It's a so more do you, process. Do you still play the guitar? Almost never. I mean, in fact, my 16-year-old daughter has um, borrowed my guitar and it's permanently in her possession now and she's teaching herself, which is nice. Um, I have a little guitar with four pairs of strings, which is a 16th century instrument. Well, it's a copy of a 16th century instrument. It's tuned like the top four strings of a modern guitar, but a fourth higher. So it's a little instrument in A. It's very like a Renaissance ukulele, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what it's like. Yeah. So, so I I was asking because it would be interesting if if you if you pick up a, a six string uh, a nylon string guitar right now, if some of that innocent um, 
understanding and connection with the instrument would, would instantly come back somehow or if that is not as, not accessible anymore after having studied the lute. I, I think it might to some extent come back but when I've tried a little bit there have been two issues. One is that I, the, the lute has an unbelievably light tension mm -hmm. and my whole sort of touch has become so delicate <laughs> that mm -hmm. when I pick up a guitar and almost nothing comes out and that's mm -hmm. a bit of shock um, mm -hmm. because the fingers require so much more strength on the guitar mm -hmm. and um, you know we, we, we accommodate to whatever we're playing on and, and my fingers have accommodated to the Renaissance lute. The other thing of course is that I played with nails mm -hmm. and now I don't have nails, I, I play the strings of the lute with the flesh of the fingertips. So again, almost nothing comes out when I pick up the guitar. But what might be fun would be to try a sort of relatively lightly strung uh, instrument and mm -hmm. play around with it a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in um, the process of learning. And I would say that that's been like ma a major theme in my life to study, you know, learning. Uh, rather than music or learning a musical instrument, it's 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 the, the concept of right, and our, our conversation starting with that uh, um, exchange about the fact that there is something different about the childlike learning towards or compared to the uh, adult way of learning is uh, is very fascinating. Do, do you find the same thing to be true in your own experience? Um, I would say, I would say, well, obviously, yes, yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I have a daughter now who's only 15 months old. So, so I see it every day. I experience every day the, the effortless learning and the uh, sort of almost like uh, superpower that children have to learn, right? Like from the perspective of an older person, yeah. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Um, However, I have sort of, I believe that the principles that apply when a child does childlike learning are the same principles that work also for adults. It's just harder to access a standard state of mind and a state of, of uh, uh, physical relationship with the, with the task at hand mm. to um, you know, and I think that's really what the different the the, the principles um, seem to be. Uh, I don't want to say the same because I don't know, but you know, but mm. <laughs> but because I find that it it all has to do with being with being uh, able to have the like this diaphragm, what I call diaphragm, or like a layer between the conscious processing of our mind and the subconscious. Like when when we are able to let things through, like this, you know, this this little bit of skin in between, or we can have like these little holes or gateways in it, or it can be, uh, you know, like things can seep through it in both directions. When when we get into a state like that, that's when learning really, really, really takes place, yeah. and when change takes place. And and I I see that in, in my daughter. I mean, it's only one child, so. I, it's, but I can see that she's capable of zoning out. That's how what, what I, I would call it. Like it's and that that there that's where the effortlessness seems to come from. That's I mean that's the observation I'm making right at this moment. Maybe in a couple of months I will have a different opinion. And but in my teaching at least, or in my in my uh, studies about learning, I see that it's still the same even for adults. Like if you get into that oscillation between con being conscious and subconscious almost at the same time because you change back and forth so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, that's when, when the, the deep learning happens. That makes really good sense. It, um, and in fact, it connects with something I'm very interested in, which is the idea of, of trying, mm -hmm. almost trying too hard. Mm -hmm. If we can put aside trying and just allow you know the difference between doing and allowing. Um, yes, that for me is really important. And of course, okay, if I'm teaching a lute student and they have a really difficult passage of music to, to play, um, which simply takes 
you know, rehearsal, repetition. Yeah. Um, there, but there are different kinds of different ways of doing that. One way is to beat your head against a wall and keep making the same mistakes over and over again, or playing with too much tension or whatever. And the other is to try and let all that go, take a deep breath, get grounded, mm -hmm. and um, and slow things down, slow yourself down, and try and do everything with minimum effort. Um, which is for me the equivalent of of not trying or not trying too hard, and that seems that seems to remove a barrier and makes learning easier. But a lot of people, a lot of grown-ups, funnily enough, don't mm -hmm. seem to have the patience because yeah. we're always in a hurry, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Patience really is is the word there, and I have to say, I I really I'm a very patient person. But I didn't know until I started to work with a lot of other people <laughs> where I can see they're not patient with themselves at all. Mm. And, and I, I, I see the damage that... Well, I don't want to say that the patience does damage because patience in the end is a very positive state and, and trait you can have as a person. Right? Um, but if you're not patient with yourself, Maybe there should be a different, another word for it, <laughs> uh, because it's. It, I, I find it really destructive. Yeah. yeah. People don't. People don't get to experience the act of, uh, or the the, the, the their uh, commitment for something never comes to fruition because the commitment gets short, shorted by impatience, right? Yeah. Yeah, oh, I think that's right. Um, and I mean, there's we can demand a lot of ourselves. We can be, we can expect high. You can expect great things of ourselves. We can, we can aim to achieve the very best we can, we can do, but still be patient. You know. You yeah. know. I think we. It's so easy to be a bit self-punishing, isn't it? <laughs> and say, oh, not good enough. Not good enough. Try harder. No, don't try. Stop trying. <laughs> Just be patient. Yeah, it's 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 so funny. Like as you as you say these things, I I think back on my early childhood and like probably a few things my father said to me. And uh, <laughs> I'm I think I learned I actually learned to be very patient with myself because other people were not so patient with myself. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and 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 sort of like this um, this idea to well, you you know you know my music, right? And and it's um, when I tell people that I hardly ever practice music, it's astonishing them to them. Like I really I really just work on movement. I just work on on very basic um, uh, ways to. Yeah, to, well, it's sort of like the, you could say it's on ways to control what I do, but in the, in the way it's exactly the opposite, to not control what I do, so to have the, the body free, so mm -hmm. the body can just, just react to anything, and, and then it's only my attitude towards my, 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 my physical actions, let's say, that turns those physical actions into music. Mm. <laughs> it's mm. uh, it's very it's very very interesting, and it's and this is this is where and, and basically as yes, an improvisation, and 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 you um, um, as a performer of, I mean you do a lot of performance uh, performing of, of written music, right? So it's 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 really quite um, the opposite. Um, what we do, but I find that I find that same. I, well, I feel, I feel there's, and I just said that I think I wrote that on Facebook recently, where I, I was listening to your new record, and it really felt to me like the performance is so amazing; it transcends the music itself somehow. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's interesting. I mean, one of the things that that attracts me so much to music of the of that period, the 16th century. Mm -hmm. Is that improvising was a huge part of what mm -hmm. musicians did. Mm -hmm. um, so, a lute player would improvise on a 
well-known chord progression of the day, just the way a jazz player will now, or a rock player or whatever, they would also uh, be able to, um, or the best players anyway, would be able to create a prelude or a fantasy, some kind of music that's freely composed but improvised on the spot, sometimes even with proper counterpoint, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, and they could also take a song that they'd heard sung, you know, which was usually polyphonic as well, and turn that into a loop piece. And so on that particular recording that you've been so kind about, um, there's a certain amount of improvising going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you will have seen that some of those pieces are my own transcriptions anyway. Um, but I've gone beyond that and did sort of additional stuff in the recording sessions that, that didn't get written down. So there's a little bit of improvisation on top, although it is working to a pretty strict structure. But it's the improvisatory aspect of it that, that um, fascinates me so much. Yeah, and, and fascinates me as well. When, when did that um, aspect of improvisation within a written structure, let's say, and even if it's just a chord sequence or a melody, when did that, that come available to you as a player? Was that something that has always been part of your musical imagination, let's say? Or did that require a certain, uh, well, technique, like mental technique or physical technique? I think, I think actually the answer to that is quite complicated because it's both things. Um, from my experience of playing styles of music other than classical, I already had some ability to improvise in say rock or blues or a little bit of jazz or something from my teenage years. Mm -hmm. um, that became very useful later because many classical musicians have absolutely no experience of doing that at all. Although this is changing a bit, I, as so I understand. Um, but the other thing for me is that when I'm improvising in this context, you know, in the context of playing 16th century music, I'm improvising in a style that I've been immersed in for 30 years or something. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to be able to sort of feel that particular way of, of shaping music sort of in my bones because I've been doing it so long. So when I was creating my own versions of this 16th century vocal music for this album, I wasn't consciously sort of modernizing it or updating it or changing the style to a modern style. I was sort of trying to improvise in the sound world that you might have heard at the time. But on the other hand, equally important would be to, to be true to, to myself. You know, I'm, I wasn't consciously adopting something that's alien to myself. It's very much part of myself, that, that stuff, even though it's 500 years old, you know. So what I'm trying to say is that my improvising in that context comes partly from an understanding of that style and doing it so much, but it's also partly from a background of just being open to, to improv and, and being inspired by improv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, 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 uh, I have, I have a relatively new student, um, who, um, is, or is already like a bebop player and wants to play bebop. I'm not a jazz musician, I'm, I'm not a bebop player at all, but he started doing this experiment with me to uh, see how my, my way of teaching or my teaching method, which I don't think there's a method, it changes all the time really, but uh, works with what he has in mind. And so I, like, over uh, the course of a month or so, I taught him how to play random notes. and. Um, like we were saying, like to be to to loosen up to the idea that it, that he can just move his hand or his fingers, and ev anything, everything that comes out, is an expression of of what he did did or what he does in that very moment. And only um, uh, I think like it was a couple nights ago, we started applying that actually to bebop to chord changes. Mm -hmm. And I asked him to play like these these random notes, and it was amazing because suddenly he was coming up with these phrases that clearly belong to the sound world of bebop. Basically, from like evaluating what his fingers were doing 
like listening. I really, it was just, you could hear that he was actually starting to listen to what his fingers were doing. And he was then making some sort of mostly subconscious adjustments there. Hmm. And I, I basically even helped and said, okay, like when you, when you feel that tension, when you hear that tension, you, have, you want to resolve, simply move the hand up of one fret. That's kind of like just what I have to start with. And I like the second version was move down a fret. The third version was play a tritone, right? And, and, and it was fascinating. It, was, it took us one hour to turn like the random notes that he played on top of, it was just two, two, two chords, a two chord vamp to turn that into the sound world of people that he had immersed himself in for, for all his life. So mm-hmm. that, that sound is readily available if we, if we spend enough time with it. And if we prepare our body accordingly, we, I think we can sort of ex- access the sound world simply by letting our body free, doing, you know, move free, freely. That makes perfect sense to me. And in fact, I would, I would also say mind, you know, mind and body being inseparable. Yeah. Really. Because um, one, of, one interesting observation I've made is when I first started um, improvising in public, I couldn't, it was, I couldn't get anywhere near what I could do when no one was listening, <laughs> you know, because of the various, the tension, the physical tension, the um, anxiety that comes with performing in public sometimes. Mm-hmm. So, so I realized we can practice improvising in a private room for years, but we have to practice improvising with an audience present mm-hmm. also, because mm-hmm. otherwise we won't make the transition from the one to the other. And to me, that's entirely about the mind-body relationship and what goes on in our psyche and what goes on in our fingers when we're um, under a certain amount of stress. Yes. Yeah, yeah, clearly. And. Uh... And just 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 an hour ago, I, I spoke with, with with a friend, and and he was making a comment about a, um, a duo improvisation he recorded with somebody else, and he said, "Yeah, as always, like he is complaining, he doesn't like what he played on the guitar, right? It wasn't wasn't me, somebody else." And and I I realized ah, there's there's like a big difference between the people who sort of I know just sort of make it to be. Um, respected performers or respected improvisers versus versus those who are maybe great improvisers <laughs> uh, but really don't understand that they are and don't accept and this is this is like I say that's the, the the mind the mind part of it and I agree that playing in front of audiences and playing with other musicians also as a it's an intermediate step I could say mm-hmm. uh, is is very very necessary to develop the skill to be kind of confident with putting yourself out there, and uh, like with a sound world as complex as as yours, let's say, which you know, like where there is a skeleton, a musical skeleton uh, to reference, mm. um, that is, it's not easy. <laughs> it's certainly not easy. No, and and I've, one of the things I've always enjoyed the most is the occasional opportunities I get to improvise alongside musicians from other traditions Mm -hmm. because then I can forget about that style that I've absorbed um, entirely and and find a different way of interacting so um, I've done I've been lucky enough to do a few concerts with a quartet consisting of the singer John Potter and the sax player John Sermon Mm -hmm. um, and myself and a fiddle player from Bratislava Mm -hmm. uh, called Milos Valent and Mm -hmm. uh, we we've done a bit of medieval and renaissance stuff but sort of improvised on it and we've also done a few things uh, in, in public which have been completely unprepared unplanned completely free all four of us improvising together and on those rare occasions when when that's gone really really well i've been ecstatic you know i felt something i've never felt before what a miracle to <laughs> when that happens or People listening to each other and reacting, um, and I can't even begin to describe in words what happens when it works. I mean, this is, for you is obviously very familiar. For me, it's really special because I don't get to do it very often. Mm-hmm. But, um, and of course, sometimes it's mediocre, and sometimes mm-hmm. it's really special. And um, 
that experience was so exhilarating to me that um, it just makes me want to do more because I feel like a complete beginner in that context, um, but get so much enjoyment from it, enormously satisfying. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can understand why some musicians are entirely addicted to doing doing free improv all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I spoke with uh, Carlos Torabi just a few weeks ago, who, uh, and and he, he said he said that he discovered free improv for himself um, just a couple of years ago, and he was as ecstatic as as you are, and, and well, I'm ecstatic about it as well. And I said, so it's sort of like the like probably the music of our time should be like that that improvised free music, and it, you know we know it's been around for such a, for a long time. But but somehow somehow it has uh, has not really found the audience uh, so that it could could really show its power in in uniting people right like whether there's the occasional like uh, improv drone show that people do with synthesizers or something like that right mm -hmm. but when when it comes to um, acoustic instruments it's it's become rather rare yeah 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 and I think. Musicians um, do it for the love of it. They certainly don't do it for the money, do they? <laughs> um, and I, it's, it's very interesting also to me um, the difference between the performer's experience and the audience's experience. Because we can sometimes feel completely over the moon after a performance of that sort. And the audience doesn't particularly necessarily get it. On the other hand, sometimes you get feedback from the audience. Oh, that was wonderful. That was amazing. And you think, was it? <laughs> That's fascinating too, isn't it? it? It's it's super fascinating. And you know, as we as we speak, I I think I have probably touched a lute like twice in my life or something. So I have some idea of that delicateness there. And having seen um, some videos of you play, and also like I remember like old photos seen of you, and like I see this. Well, let me put this down. Uh, there's like a certain. There's a certain. It's if it's even difficult to put into words, but there's a certain stance. There's a certain interaction that is sort of or energetic interaction that's sort of like visible even from on a photograph. Hmm. There is there's this this. I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like it looks to me as if there's like this aspect of of sort of like caressing. The instrument. It's it's more of it's more of a. I mean, how would you describe what it feels like to play the lute at the level that you do? Well, I think the way you describe it is very good, um, because it's um you know it has a big round back. It's sort of it has its own acoustic built in. It's a it's a it's a chamber, um, and the tension is very light. The strings are double, so if you hit them hard, they just clash. If you want a full, warm, strong sound, well, relatively strong, you have to effectively coax the sound out of the strings using the flesh of the fingertips. So when you say caressing, I would perhaps say coaxing. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of persuading the lute to sing. I'm, I'm trying to let this, the song out of the lute. Um, and that connects also with, with the way I like to think about playing this music, which is, um, I think it's about how do I describe it? Somebody once said to me, when certain other lute players play this music, it feels like they're saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, listen to me. When you play this music, this person said to me, um, I feel like you're saying, listen to this wonderful music. Mm -hmm. And that was my favorite review ever mm -hmm. that anyone ever gave me, because that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to share this music that I love. And I, I, sort of trying to get out of the way, actually, myself. I don't mm -hmm. at all want it to be about me. And by the way, that's a perfect cure for stage fright. <laughs> if you if you can go out on stage, not that you need me to tell you this, but maybe somebody else will be interested. If you go out on stage and say to yourself, it's not about me. I'm sharing beautiful music with an audience. I want them to love the music. I don't particularly care if they love me. Um, it makes me go away out of the equation a little bit, and then I'm not frightened really because it's a, it's a, a sharing experience instead of a, oh, what if I fail? You know, 
what what if I do it badly? What if they don't like me? You know. That's wonderful, but it also brings up the question, like, what really is that? What really is you? What is that aspect of me that you are removing from the equation? Mm. Um, like you could, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there is a simple answer to that. Somebody could say, okay, that's the ego, right? Or like there, there are pre prefabricated answers to this question. But really what I'm interested in is, is that is that purely a mind thing or is there a physical aspect to not being involved in not getting the ego involved in playing? I think there might be, and I think that might be what you were getting at when you talked about caressing the strings. I've seen people play even lutes, which are so delicate, as though they were grand pianos, sort of bashing them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you will, you will, it's like um, beating a horse or something. You will do this for me, you know, <laughs> bash, bash, bash. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas what I think I'm doing is, is trying to persuade or, or um, coax rather than I, I'm, I try never to be fighting with, against the instrument. I try to be working with the instrument. And maybe that goes along with the ego thing, with the, um, you know, not imposing my will so much as just just trying to have a almost a union between me and the music. And then the, the, I don't disappear. Of course I don't. What really happens is that I become the music and the music becomes me. You know. That that That's very, very interesting. Um... Because if we if we don't if we want to just talk about this like very down to earth without any spiritual or like even psychological talk about it, it's really um, I think it's it's about the feedback loop that you're that you're accessing or allowing yourself to access as you as you play a musical instrument. And so for me, like a, a, a realization over the last few years was that when I play my touch instrument, which really vibrates. I mean, it's a great, great instrument, so it, it really vibrates a lot. The instrument has a good resonance, right? Mm. However, like the, the, the energy I put into the string is very, very little. So, so the, the vibration is very, very delicate. However, I realized, I started realizing that even my thumbs on the back of the neck register that resonance, the vibration, and sort of, it's almost as if within the hand there is a feedback loop already that that kind of like like you say tries to to to, to almost miss well in a in massage the dough that is the note right to to bloom yeah to, uh, and 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 that happens and that's what 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 was so fascinating that happens entirely within my hand like there's no there's no conscious process at all um that that kind of tells me like yeah and now you need to add a little bit of vibrato so the notes you know sustains for another 30 milliseconds or something mm -hmm. right? it's just totally automatic right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's it's i think i might i would call that um um making it sing mm -hmm. you know? yeah you're, you're you can do go through the physical movement of depressing the string or you could get a machine that could do that for you you know, but what you're doing is something more than that because you're you're bringing out that vocal quality somehow, not consciously. Just it's what your hand is doing, and I see that with really advanced players of many different stringed instruments. There's a certain thing they do that makes the music sing that you sometimes don't see in lesser players or you don't see in amateurs or beginners, and it's a hard thing to teach, isn't it? If you're teaching a student, maybe it's not. Maybe you could tell me how you do it, because I find it a hard thing to teach. Well, I, I would I would never start from the from the perspective of saying something is hard. I would I would try <laughs> to teach it, and I think I do teach that sort of uh, awareness. And and you know, like th that's why the touch instrument is so wonderful. It it kind of like focuses everything onto this 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 uh, physical aspect of you know just creating that note with one fingertip. Right, and the fingertip is responsible for for starting the note and for ending the note and for everything in between, 
and and so that is that is sort of it's beautiful and and like I said like the the feedback loop uh, kind of like in uh, incorporates all the senses it's not just listening to it it's also like feeling the vibration of the string under your finger it's feeling the vibration of the neck uh, and it's the listening and it's like what I uh, encourage people to do is to um, use the processing power that the visual sense takes up to 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 kind of like divert that to the to the to the uh, the haptic um, you know in the kinesthetic sense mm -hmm. and the listening and, and the ears so it's it's uh, like the auditory world and the haptic world kind of like comes together when when I'm teaching uh, music. And, and, and the visual is sort of like just, uh, it's important, but it's, it's sort of just to ensure that if there's like a certain note you really know you want to play, that you can check and can be sure that you're actually landing on that fret, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 but yeah, I think, I think it, is, it is possible to, to teach this, um, this deeper um, understanding if the if the person you're talking to um, wants to hear it, yeah, 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 yes. So much of teaching is to do with whether you're on the same wavelength as the whether you and your teacher are on the same wavelength or can find that wavelength. Yeah, and of course, part of the fun of teaching is finding that place where you and and the pupil can can connect, because it's going to be different with every single person, isn't it? We can't do the same thing with every student. We, it, that would be impossible. No, that doesn't doesn't work at all. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, uh, are you uh, teaching privately, or are you uh, working for a school or university? Or well, I of course all my teaching is online now, um, mm -hmm. and much of it is private teaching. But quite often, a music college, you know, a conservatoire or a university gets. A lute student, which you know, very often it's a, it's a rare occurrence, and then they contact me and say, "Can you, can you, teach this person for us?" So I sort of teach externally for many different places. Um, I have a student at Dur Durham University now who's who's doing a PhD, and I've been teaching her on on um, you know online. Um, she was at Oxford before, and I was teaching her for Oxford University then. So there's a certain amount of teaching on behalf of different institutions but mainly I teach amateur players who, who, um, who come to me privately mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it's how small is the loot world well uh, there's I, I couldn't name numbers but mm -hmm. the, you know there's a community out there of people who amateur loot players and they're a very important community because they're the ones who finance the uh, who buy the loot records and, and who buy the loots from the makers because there's some wonderful loot makers out there and if they only made loots for professionals they would soon um, go under because there's a much smaller number of us professionals um, and yeah the, it's it's a small world I don't know how it compares to say you know the world of the you know the Northumbrian pipes or the some other slightly mm. niche instrument um, mm. probably there are more pipers than lutenists, I suspect. Mm -hmm. But that's something that's changed a lot in the years I've been doing it. Maybe not the amateur numbers so much, but the professional numbers. When I first became a professional lute player in the late 80s, um, there were a handful of us, and we sort of all knew each other. And now there are many, many professionals out there who are quite a lot younger than I am, whom I haven't encountered. You know, the numbers have increased exponentially. It's wonderful to see. It is wonderful, and I, I did not expect you to say that. So, do you have any idea uh, what, how that happened? Well, I think it happened chiefly through the development of Baroque period instrument performance, because all of these Baroque orchestras sprang up, um, which required continual loops, you know, instruments to accompany the singing and the, the orchestra playing and so on. Um, and those were mainly the long neck loops, you know, the theorbo, the, the arch lute, and so on. Um, and that's the area of the lute world that's expanded greatly. Not so much the Renaissance lute, which is what I do, um, because the work really is in the Baroque world. 
that's where the big expansion has taken place. So there's now a good group of, of continuo players who make a living chiefly doing that, you know, playing with, with orchestras, company singers, and so on. Um, and there, yes, there are a few more Renaissance League players around than there were before, but that's not such a dramatic change. Really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just, do you, well, I know the answer already, but do you ever think that you might have or should have taken a different path in your musical life? No. Oh, no. And you knew I would say that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, of course. But it's, it's, I think it's an important question because um, I believe that we also need to ask ourselves that question occasionally just to check. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, and of course, our idea of what we want to do and how we want to do it changes over time, doesn't it? Um, for example, when I first started getting professional work, and making recordings, I think possibly my chief preoccupation was to succeed, was to um, not to make too much of a, a fool of myself, but to do a reasonably good job and be liked. And I would take whatever work was offered and got lots and lots of experience playing with lots and lots of different musicians. And now, the older I get, the more I feel that I don't want to to take work on just because it's work. I only want to take on work that um, that actually has a meaningful quality to me. So something that's rewarding. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to say when you're when you have a career and you've reached a certain age and and you can afford to turn down work. But but I feel more and more that the work I do, I want it to be rewarding, not financially, but I want I want to feel that it's um, it helps me to progress as a musician, to, to, you know, to continue to learn and to continue to improve. Um, I'm less and less interested in doing stuff simply because it's there and it's being offered to me, you know. Yeah, yeah. And in, in a way, this 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 uh, Corona situation sort of, I guess, has thrown people back into the um, world where they maybe have to accept work that they really don't normally wouldn't do. And probably me, even I would include myself in that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's yeah. it's not it's not a pleasant uh, situation to be in. But just come back to you. So would you would you say that you are uh, that you are successful in what you do? Is that kind of like a term or a feeling or uh, a concept that that you sort of uh, that is kind of like important to you? By successful, do you mean? Um in my own terms, or you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, you're, 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 no, no, your definition. Of. In, in my own, yeah, I think. Well, for, for example, when I completed this last album, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to, to move in the right direction now. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm starting to, um, to make progress. Um, this, this, that recording has something, has a sort of integration of all the things that I'm interested in, which, which maybe I haven't achieved before. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that's a, that's a success. Mm -hmm. I always, always want to improve um, or stop one or the other. <laughs> I don't <laughs> want to keep going on the same level. Mm -hmm. um, or yeah, improve is is the best word I can think of. Maybe what I really mean is is grow and develop. You know, yeah. I guess every musician feels that, except the ones who've got stuck in a rut. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think there is the, the difference probably between people who are um, um, it's, it's just kind of like difficult. But like I have this I have this this worldview that we all are the beings, you know, um, they we, we kind of like this is continuum of people who create like certain materials, let's say that then are being offered to other beings to work with. And they're sort of like there, there's materials that are kind of like more basic, let's say, and then there are then there are creations that are more uh, built upon these these. And 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 I think that as like the artist, the traditional idea of the artist, I think is the person who creates like the basic materials that 
every other human or every other being sort of kind of like draws energy from yeah so it's 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 really um, um, and and I I think that for art for that kind of artist there's always kind of, as you say this 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 idea to want to improve or as you say grow um, in a way, we're coming back to what we said at the beginning. I think it's the idea is to get back to that childlike, effortless kind of creation of knowledge or uh, creative energy, let's say. Uh, and and so that sort of kind of what interests me, at least, is through my 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 practicing. I don't think I will ever not sound like myself, and I already sound like myself. Already 25 years ago, I sounded like myself, and I I was already a complete person and a complete musician back then. Um, but somehow I take in or I, I I enjoy the process of seeing that there are different ways to get to myself, mm. or and and I explore these different ways, and 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 that's kind of like what is what is of interest, and that's that's. In the end, then that means like I have different modes, or or even also a continuum of of behavior, let's say, that creates the same result. Like you know, it's it's for me, it's not very hardly ever about the result when I play or even when I compose. It's about the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very interesting, um, and. Uh, you know, one of the things I've had to do a lot is is accompany, quite often accompany mm -hmm. singers, solo singers, and that involves a different sort of um, losing of the self because you have to, I have to completely tune into that person. Mm -hmm. I have to sort of think like them, I have to breathe with them, I have to feel with them, mm -hmm. and every singer is different just as every student is different when you're teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, you can, if you can sort of, well, it's a very intimate process. You're becoming one with the person you're accompanying. Um, that's that's part of it too. Um, I'm not quite sure why I brought this up because I'm not quite sure how it connects with no, what no, you no, were. No. Saying, but it seems I don't important. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's interesting because as you. Uh, I, I have um, hardly, I have never put myself into a position where I'm actually working for somebody else, really. Um, that has never been my thing because I had this uh, drive to, uh, to realize my own vision. And, and the vision, the vision is, the, is kind of what, is, what I am. The, I am the vision. I'm not the performer, I'm not the guitar player, I'm not, you know, it's, it's, it's the vision. And so for me it was very important. To say, okay, I'm I'm egotistical in that sense. Like I do really want to um, be a good person for myself. I want to be a good performer for myself. I want I want to make sure that that vision can uh, come to fruition somehow. Yeah. So that's why I have sort of avoided these situations that you just described, and and so it's it's much harder for me. To um, and I, I'm not saying like not not technically. I think technically I could be. Uh, I'm I'm also a very good in uh, becoming one with another person, but um, just just to be in the supportive role, let's say, mm -hmm. is something I'm not used to at all. Yeah, although I think I find when I'm accompanying, when it's really working well, it's a kind of co-creation, you know. Yeah, for sure. Rather it is. than. So I suppose you're supporting each other, but you're both leading. You're both following. I guess you're both doing both. You know? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And of course, in your experience of of doing improvised work with, say, well, as it happens, one of my favorite recordings of yours is with the the wonderful pianist Sanchez Angelica Sanchez. Is that yeah, her? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that recording because mm -hmm. um, that's sort of about various people tuning into each other, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's 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 an incredible record that really yeah, I don't think only a handful of people really appreciate. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me that you that you <laughs> like that one so much. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and you know, it's just um, like when we're talking about ourselves, um, that is sort of like always like a, a re reflection of what of also the, our past ways of putting thoughts into words. And so I I, um, I realized that, and in, in a way, it's kind of like part of doing these interviews also, that I'm sort of exploring how I think, and like as I say something to you, I realize I said something very similar to a guest like two weeks ago, and and it's sort of an interesting for me. It's it's and but in a way that kind of describes actually how I am as a musician as well, like constantly questioning, and like I I I really in an ideal world I would I want to be a non-habitual animal right <laughs> so so that's why I'm exploring my habits to understand like how can I maybe by becoming aware of certain habits how can I then make a decision that is different and by even by saying this, I mean, this 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 is uh, interesting because it kind of like applies to learning music, also or playing music, is you're making you have to make choices sometimes, or you're making choices sometimes which are not, which are not natural. Natural in the sense of like it doesn't always have to feel effortless, right? There are moments where there is, where there is an effort that almost like you say where it could sometimes feel like it's forced. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that that extra amount of force is actually needed just in that very in that moment. Like yeah. I always want to kind of like go back to my uh, relaxed self, right? But there's like the, the, there's these moments where this excess energy, uh, excess of energy, is kind of like needed to to function. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and it's making the choice to use it when it's appropriate and. Uh, to leave it when it's not appropriate. Yes. <laughs> um, it's interesting that, you know, when, when, when I uh, was thinking about, like, that I finally have, uh, will have the opportunity to talk to you, I really didn't want to talk to you about music or lute playing so much. Because <laughs> I, I find, like, like, there's nothing, not much to say. Like, but but you know, I listen to your playing, and that's 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 all I need to know. But then, as as I talk to another to an artist, I get kind of curious, and I want to understand how does Jacob do what he does, you know? and uh, can help myself to get into this kind of discussion. And mm. uh, now, like my initial idea was to ask you something like, like what what do you usually not talk about? Like what do you what do you not enjoy talking about? Which kind of topics do you usually avoid? Um, this is kind of like interesting to me as well. And there's there's one uh, something I know about you is that you that you don't take flights. Is that correct? Well, I I don't fly for work. Yeah. Not for work. I have some family in, back in the States where I originally came from mm -hmm. um, and I go sort of every few years to see my family in the States. But I made the decision about 10 years ago now mm -hmm. to stop flying for work, mm -hmm. which meant that I gave up performing in the Far East and in America and so on. Mm -hmm. But living here in England, well, until a few days ago when we finally departed from the, from the EU, um, it was easy to get on a train and mm. travel sometimes. Well, the great thing about the loot, of course, is I'm carrying a loot or I'm carrying two loots. I'm, I don't have equipment, gear. Mm -hmm. It's all yeah. it's all sort of portable. Um, and I could get on a train and go to Spain or Eastern Europe or something. Often it would take two days and I'd I'd stop in Cologne or Brussels or Amsterdam or something or Barcelona and then continue my journey. And I, I've had so much enjoyment traveling slowly across Europe to do gigs, um, and I've not really regretted giving up the giving up working further afield. And that's been the reason for giving up flying was more than just the obvious, you know, ecological reason. There was also 
you know, I mentioned earlier that I like to do, I like to have experience, musical experiences that, that are meaningful rather than the sort of empty ones. Um, and I often had the experience that I would fly to the other side of the world, do a single concert and fly home again. Mm -hmm. And when I was on stage doing the concert, I wasn't really present because I hadn't really arrived yet. Mm -hmm. I think it takes me a long time to arrive somewhere, much longer than, than flying does, would, would take. So I would do the performance, it would feel a bit meaningless because I wasn't really present. And then I would fly home again, and the whole thing would be like a dream. Did I actually do that? And what was the point of it anyway? <laughs> you know, um, whereas the strange thing is, when I do the slow travel, when I go to Poland or something on a train from, from the north of England where I live, it's amazing because I'm... I'm really there when I get there. Mm -hmm. I may be tired, mm -hmm. but I've had the experience of traveling in real time and on the ground. And I'm in a much better position to actually do a concert that has, that involves meaningful interaction between me and the audience because I'm present. That's speaking for myself personally. I mean, it may be different. Other people are probably quite good at stepping off planes and doing a gig and flying home again. I've never been able to make that work for myself. So part of it was part of this journey of, of finding more musical satisfaction in the world. I do. If that makes that, sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I don't know where I heard that or read that just a long time ago. Um, somebody said to me that like the main, the main problem that human beings have is that we're capable of traveling much faster than we're able to kind of, um, I don't know what, what he, she said, or if I read it somewhere, then, then kind of like our body or our mind is capable of traveling. Mm -hmm. So that always like something is being left, be left behind, you could say, or, or never even catches up sometimes. And, uh, yeah. And it's uh, it's interesting because if you're if you're thinking about the the animal kingdom, right? Like, like the the the, the bird may may fly, you know, for thousands and thousands of miles, and also know how to return home at some mm. point. Mm. But it's sort of it's sort of like that. Um, um, it's yeah. So so I, I it's you know like I'm I'm the opposite. Like I don't have any or hardly any opportunity to play locally. Mm -hmm. And and when I when I tour with with Pat and Tony, who are both based in the U.S., uh, you know that's that's kind of like where I feel like the home base of the band is because I'm I'm the the foreigner right mm -hmm. over and and I have. I think my my way of dealing with that was like that this sort of dream dreamlike. Uh, state, which is basically, yeah, I stay, I stay home, really, and it's just like my dream body that leaves. Uh, um, is that I try to take advantage of the fact that I'm not totally there. So, saying like again, like something we said before, I ac access like my my subconscious. I do not, I don't, don't even want or need to be present to perform, and and I know that that aspect of what I do is what people enjoy. And and maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people would e even uh, enjoy my playing even more if I were present. <laughs> Probably, but it's just not possible. And yeah. like with traveling to the U.S., I have the feeling that it takes me about I would say six, seven, eight weeks of uh, being there um, to really arrive. Mm. And I can I can feel that um, that my 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 overall uh, biological rhythm. Uh, takes that much time to to arrive there. Like whenever I go to the U.S., I wake up early. I'm not a person who wakes up early, but there I do. Mm -hmm. It's that it's that six hours usually like time difference, and yeah, uh, yeah it's interesting. Yeah, and and um, yeah, I've 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 uh, kind of like sometimes followed your your trips or uh, when you were posting on social media, right? <laughs> and realized like, okay, now he's he's traveled for for three days uh, <laughs> to get to Portugal or <laughs> something like that. And I I I, I think it's uh, it's great. And I mean, it, I also have to say like, if you if you can afford to do that, that that's a real luxury. So it's wonder wonderful. It is a luxury. It shouldn't be. Because of course, you know, yeah. that's but that's how it is. It's very expensive to go by train, um, mm -hmm. 
I've been very lucky. I mean, I haven't. It, one thing that's necessary in order to do this is is actually not to have a, a calendar that's too full, because you, if you need say two or three days on either side of a concert to get there and get home again, you can't. Um, I can't be in Portugal one day and in, in Germany the next day or something. I have to allow a couple of days to get from A to B. Uh, but I like having space, uh, and I'm lucky because um, I'm, I'm managing, I'm coping. My, uh, having enough to live on is what's important to me, um, not having more than that, really. Um, so it's a, it is a luxury, absolutely. And I completely, I would never want to pass judgment on somebody who does things differently. I know mm-hmm. people have to do what they have to do. And my sort of feeling that that I communicate more meaningfully with the audience if I've traveled slowly. That's me. It's, it's, it's different for other people, of course. And you're, it's interesting to hear your experience because you've almost made a, made a sort of virtue of necessity by, uh, you know, <laughs> by finding a way to capitalize on the, on the dreamlike state. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 I there there's you know I remember that we started kind of like talking writing right that's the first time we talked today but like um, writing about um, me maybe composing a piece that you could play and um, ever since um, I don't can't even remember who made the original suggestion there but ever since that thought is in my head I've been writing this piece believe it or not fantastic. No, it's it, inside, right? It's it's for me the, the process of, of writing music is something that takes a very very long time. It's sort of um, funny to see how like when people, what people see of me, or it's like the uh, Marcus, do you ever sleep? Or blah blah blah, and like you, it's very it's very different in reality. Like in reality, like all most of the work I do just happens when I do nothing mm-hmm. and I have I have to have these islands of silence and islands of solitude which more recently have been difficult to get I have to admit um, I, I need those those um, moments of reflection for uh, musical ideas well I don't even want to call them up because not ideas it's it's fully fledged um, emotional representations of something that I will then put into notes or, you know, the mm-hmm. score. And um, and your, your, the piece for you is, it's already there, in a way. And it's, 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 really, it's really fascinating, I mean... <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's wonderful. Do, do, do you write? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I haven't created anything that's that I would say is necessarily worth listening to, <laughs> but for me it springs out of Im- of of the improv- improvisation that I do. Um, yeah. I'm sure that must be true for a lot of people who write. Mm-hmm. Um, an interesting thing about the history of the lute is that all the lute composers were lute players, and many of the lute players were composers. But you don't find great works written for the lute in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Apart from Bach, he's the one exception. In all other in all other cases, all surviving lute music was written by lute players, almost without exception. Um, so, because, maybe because it's such an idiomatic and, and special instrument, um, you have to have a kind of pretty deep sense of of what it does. On the other hand, it can be an advantage if you don't, <laughs> because then you might make something new and different. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's one thing that that I really don't like about acoustic instruments or musical instruments per se, even, is that there is such a thing as idiomaticness. I don't know if that word exists. There, there, there it's sometimes it's really it's really putting me off as a composer, where like I. I do not want to write something that comes from from the instrument, really. 
I, I want that I want that the music that the musician sort of has to work <laughs> to make, it's not it's not that I want to make people work but I, I find that and it, this was the same for my from a string quartet for example um, don't know if you you, you know probably heard it right yeah. like I, I I did not imagine it with the sound of the string quartet in my head up until the very end when I started to write dynamics markings and stuff mm -hmm. like before I like when I heard it like some of the sketches on my on my computer I was listening with with bell and or like more like sine wave sine wavey oh. sounds because I, I wanted to be completely like I wanted to only focus on the structure of the of the of the harmonic interaction of the pitches basically right and and um, and so 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 the uh, idiomatic aspect of the lute in, in a way I feel tempted to ask you to, to tell me a little bit about it and I, I think I can probably also imagine a few things like having experience with stringed instruments and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 in, on the other hand, I really don't don't want to know, <laughs> yeah. and I want you to, to to figure out how to play whatever I come up with. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I remember very very well when I was quite a young lute player, and a guy wrote some songs for a singer and me, um, and they were quite um, quite intricate, complicated pieces, and we sat down and spent hours going through the lute part, and I would say, well, this bit. It's unplayable. Can't do it. This bit works fine. This bit I can't play. And sometimes he would just say to me, if I said this bit is unplayable, he would say, are you sure? Think again. <laughs> no, it's really unplayable. Think differently. Oh, well, actually, maybe if I do this or that, maybe it is playable. Mm -hmm. But that's but that would that required thinking, not thinking like a lute player, because it was a non non idiomatic way of doing it. But actually, yes, Here's an unusual way to do it, um, but he he would make me think twice or think three times, and I'm glad he did, because um, it made me realize that a lot of things are possible that we don't at first think think can work. You know, that's the danger of thinking idiomatically. You don't always want everything to be super comfortable on the instrument. Sometimes it's a positive advantage if if it requires an unusual technique or an extended technique or a special technique or something. Yeah, and uh, I started. I started um, with touch instruments, um, playing playing the Chapman stick originally. And the the Chapman stick, the way it is being presented, let's say, by by the inventor, and uh, you know, is is very extremely idiomatic. Like there's a certain certain sound. To it, there's a certain set of chords that can be easily played, and you know, and and. And that was so off-putting for me at the beginning that that I thought, okay, I, I need to do, and I want to do something else. And um, in a way, and and like if I if I play a melody, if I say I play a certain uh, intervallic sequence uh, on the touch instrument, for example, it's so fascinating. I almost became obsessed with this idea. Like, is there is there a way to like a almost like a mathematical way to um, derive fingering from a from from an interval sequence that always works, right? and I've sort of like cracked this cracked this code up until the interval of the fifth, right? But anything below, uh, be above sixth or seventh, they they don't work. And it requires a different system that I have not yet fully understood. And even after 25 years or more than 25 years of, of studying and researching, and and so in a way, and this you know you you've not just now opened my eyes for that. Like my 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 personal research goes into making the instrument less idiomatic. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, it makes makes sense if that's also my interest in you know, when writing music, but uh, yeah. I've never really uh, said it that clearly. Yeah, that that does make sense. In a way, it's a bit like, um, well, maybe it's not. I was going to say it's like making the instrument into a a blank slate, you know, or a tabula rasa or whatever, you know. 
it's it's like what Fripp, what Fripp, Robert Fripp did with uh, the you know the the what he calls new standard tuning, which is mm -hmm. something. That it's it's like I I use a new standard tuning on my instrument, a variation of it. Uh -huh. um, you know, like taking away the so so. Um, so, um, how aware are you n nowadays? Like, like you just gave an example from um, some time ago, right? When that that friend kind of wrote music, and you, is has your approach changed now? Like, do it has basically has your repertoire of of uh, combinations, let's say, right, uh, widened considerably, or has it been? Is it very important as for you as a lute player to 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 really uh, do you hone your craft by honoring the idiomatic aspects, or, or do you grow by by working on the, on the outside or on the outline of those? I I think, what has changed over time is that I have become more, um, more adventurous, more creative in my approach. Mm -hmm. For example, fingering. So I think that experience with the composer many years ago taught me that. Um, if we're willing to think differently, we can find new ways of doing things. One thing I'm slightly obsessed with, because Renaissance music is so intricate for the mm. left hand, is, is to find the best fingering. What is for me the best fingering? So I like to plot that, because I really think that's about 90% of the, of the battle won. <laughs> you know, if you've got good fingerings. Again, when I'm teaching, I see that people sort of do a lot of random, what I would call random fingering. So. Mm. Um, a method is important to me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to find the most efficient way of achieving this complex polyphonic stuff. But at the same time, I, I do like to keep an open mind about what what's possible. Um, okay, so is there a way for you to, to describe in just a few sentences how this method works for fingering for you? Um, what are some basic rules? Well, it starts with mechanical efficiency. So, what does that mean? Well, it means the least effort for effortful way of doing it. So, um, if if I'm if all of these four fingers are occupied at the same time, um, and the music is contrapuntal, I'm holding one finger down and changing the configuration of the other fingers, and then holding a different finger down and changing the other. Th that's a, that sort of thing. And very often, there's there aren't a lot of options available. <laughs> you know, quite often there's only one possible way to conceive of it. But, but, um, what interests me is the journey from, the journey that each finger has to make. So you know how when, some people when they're practicing, particularly perhaps inexperienced players, they get to the difficult bit, it goes wrong, they start right there at the beginning of the difficult bit, again and again and again, and I have to say. Hold on, the difficulty wasn't playing that bit, the difficulty was getting to it from the thing before. Mm -hmm. So it's about the journey be between movements. So mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like, maybe I could call it a choreography of the fingers. Yeah. Because it's, it's the journey that each individual finger makes individually, but also in relation to the other fingers. Um, I think that's what I mean by mechanical efficiency. It's finding, mm -hmm. the, the, finding the, the most efficient way to get from A to B with each finger, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, and that makes sense. Is there is there more to it, to the method? Um, now you've got me thinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's always a good thing. Um, well, another thing that enters into it, because what I've described so far is, I suppose, purely mechanical in a sense. Mm -hmm. The, the other thing that comes into it is something that you touched on before, which is which is the interaction of the hand with the instrument, the hand as a whole, um, and the the vibration of the sound and the sort of singing quality that I talk about so much. So, so yeah, the, the, there's the choreography of the fingers, the mechanical efficiency of the movements, but there's also the um, that thing that's so difficult to define, which is involves the the hand and the body as a whole, which is the thing above and beyond the mere mechanics of it. It's it's the singing quality. Let me give you um, an example from from the touch guitar playing. 
um, and I would like to hear your opinion on this. So, so if you have like two adjacent nodes half step apart, right, and you would you have your four fingers, you would usually say, okay, use first and second finger or third and fourth finger maybe to play those notes. And that would be like in terms of the journey of the fingers that would probably seem to be efficient, right? It turns out with the touch instrument, and this is this is really wonderful in a way. We're talking about journey. The journey is actually the moment in which you gather the energy to play the note, because we don't have the second hand to strike the string or to pluck the string. So 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 sometimes like you with the touch playing, it's you would play that that chromatic step from going from second to first finger or from fourth to third finger rather than the other way around. Because mm -hmm. you want that extra bit of travel distance to actually have enough space and time, well not time, space, to accelerate. And and that I mean, it's it's it. When I just say it like in a minute now, it it seems totally uh, mundane to me, like right to me. But it's been it's been such an incredible find to understand with this instrument where we actually the journey is very important, and sometimes the journey that seems that seems uh, the most efficient one. It's not the one that makes the instrument sing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that so that so that's kind of like the back and forth I'm I'm faced with as I'm as I'm uh, playing, like like maybe maybe I need to make a really ridiculous journey, <laughs> like you probably <laughs> to play on a stage in Portugal, right? But that journey adds to the presence. Of that, the performance of that very note. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I suppose, I would call that articulation, maybe. Ah, yeah. Perhaps from what what, what I think you're describing, and yeah. and then I have to differentiate between playing harmony and counterpoint using all four fingers at once in complicated ways, versus improvising a melody or playing a melody, playing a melodic line, a single melodic line, mm -hmm. which I do a lot too. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's where this idea comes in for me, because yes, if I want to create a sort of moment of impulse or uh, uh, mm -hmm. impetus or um, accent, I might use not the most mechanically efficient fingering, but one that's quite different in order to accentuate a particular note um, or to inject a certain energy into a particular passage of music or something. Yeah, so it does make sense to me what you're saying. So, so on your 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 personal journey nowadays, um, you have um, you, you're doing less traveling. Obviously, we all do. Um, have you found found a way to turn that into an advantage for yourself? Um, yes, I mean, it, talking in terms of purely of of sort of life satisfaction, you might say. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I've, I've got a little bit of teaching and I'm getting by. Um, and I miss the traveling, I miss performing with friends and colleagues. Um, and of course, when you're going everywhere on the train, the journey itself is an adventure too, mm -hmm. it's not just arriving. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I do miss that. But I am, I mean, you hear people say this all the time, I think, in the last year or so, that I'm learning to appreciate the things that are around me, mm -hmm. including my family. Also, the fact that I live in a, a beautiful part of the world and there's this wonderful countryside and I, I take a walk every day, you know, even if it's just a short walk. Um, and I have more time to cook. <laughs> I enjoy mm -hmm. cooking. I have more time to read books. Although I, it amazes me, I do find that I keep quite busy. I don't ever run out of things to do, that's for mm -hmm. sure. I'm sure you find that too. Mm -hmm. um, I somehow, you know, there's always somebody emailing asking for this or asking for that, and I like to help people out. You know, with the loot, a lot of the music is obscure, and I have a large collection of stuff that I've developed, put together over the years. 
people will email me and say, oh, do you have this particular manuscript or do you have this piece? And so I'll send stuff to people. I perform a kind of service all the time for people and I'm, I'm glad to help people. Um, so somehow there's always, there's always stuff to do. But yeah, I, I have learned to appreciate just being in one place because I haven't had that experience really ever. Certainly not in the 30 years or so that I've been touring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has its advantages. It, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's certainly not all bad. Yes, I miss certain things. But on the other hand, I'm gaining certain things that I would have otherwise. And again, maybe this is a cliche, but but I, um, I've had 30 or so years of doing, doing, doing. Mm -hmm. Always doing. And sometimes I think I've almost forgotten how to be, you know? The balance between doing and being is perhaps getting slightly better now. I'm having a little more being time, non-doing time, you know? And that, for me, that feels healthy. Mm -hmm. Again, maybe it's a luxury being a little bit older. Um, I, can, I can afford a bit of being time, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but personally, that's satisfying. Because I often say to myself, you know, it sounds very morbid, but when I lie dying, will it matter that I did lots of gigs and got some good reviews and made some money? Or will it matter that I, that I live well? Mm -hmm. I would like to, I'm, I'm a beginner at it, but I would like to, I would like to find ways of, of living well. And of course the two aren't mutually exclusive. We can live yeah, well. I was just, I was just going to say that. <laughs> Live well through our work, and of course yeah. that's what we want, isn't it? But we can also live well in uh, in other ways, and and um, it's very easy, I think, in this day and age, to be completely obsessed with quantifiable achievement. And for me, it's actually quite an achievement to spend an hour doing nothing because I'm not good at it. Mm -hmm. But I think if I can do that, it's it feels like time well spent, actually. So what, what do you do when you do nothing? <laughs> well, um, I'm usually not doing nothing. I'm usually going for a walk or reading in a book. Yeah. Um, I haven't, I can't remember the last time I literally sat and did nothing mm -hmm. for an hour. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I sometimes wonder about taking up meditation, actually. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. Um, but even having time you know, walking meditation, you know, going out into nature or, well, my other, I, I trained to be an Alexander Technique teacher quite a few years ago. I don't do much teaching, but I use it in my life and in my music all the time. Maybe that's why I'm obsessed with mechanical efficiency, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, but when I lie on the floor with my knees up and my feet flat on the floor and my head on a book, that is time very well spent mm -hmm. doing that for 20 minutes and allowing some of the tension to go away <laughs> into the floor and clear the mind a bit of all that buzzing all that constant buzzing that feels like a, a real achievement actually. the Alexander technique was a big part of my life um, between 91 and maybe 96 or something and um, I still believe that it was the Alexander Technique that, that allowed me to become a professional performer. Because I, I was literally um, like so excited when I had to, or like I had to perform that I almost couldn't. Like mm -hmm. It was so bad, the excitement and the, the pain. I would call it pain now, looking back. And um, it was working with an Alexander Technique teacher in Bielefeld, Germany, where I was studying back then, mm -hmm. that that I where I kind of like, and I don't even know, but it just just happened that suddenly it was almost like this 180 degrees of a turn, where suddenly being on stage performing was almost more comfortable than being in the audience. Right? And um, the Alexander technique had been, it was very important for me. And I, I was also close to even uh, signing up to become a teacher. Really? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then there was like a, like a personal event, like where the, uh, the teachers got divorced. 
it was a couple. And for some reason that put me off. Mm -hmm. And I still don't understand why, um, but somehow I didn't pursue um, the, the teaching, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the teacher's path then. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, well, several times during our conversation you've said things that that made me as an Alexander person think, ah, yes, Alexander. <laughs> and yeah. I wonder sometimes whether it was your Alexander experience that was speaking. For instance, when you were talking about um, uh, that permeable boundary between conscious and unconscious, um, or the fact that the mind and body interact in an inseparable way, these are all ideas that obviously are common to the Alexander technique. When I talk about the difference between doing and allowing, or the difference between doing and non-doing, I'm also influenced very strongly by the Alexander technique. It's it's um, it's like you. Uh, I, it's been very important to me as a musician, and the, the the four years, three three years of training that I did to be a teacher, were time very well spent. Even though I don't teach pure Alexander technique very much at all, I mostly just use it in my in my own life, in my own playing, in my own lute teaching. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's a hugely influential way of thinking, isn't it? It is. Uh, how did you come across it? Um, I think in quite an unusual way, because it's quite, it's quite common that people have backache or a shoulder problem or a neck problem, and they go to Alexander Technique teacher, and then they get hooked. In my case, it was curiosity. Mm -hmm. I saw something about a workshop that was being offered in Alexander Technique, and I thought. I'd like to find out what this is. I have no idea. But when I was for two years at the Royal College of Music as a postgraduate student in London, I kept seeing things about the Alexander Technique on the notice boards. Mm -hmm. and so I read this thing about the workshop and I thought, I'm going to go and see what it is. Mm -hmm. And I loved the workshop. And then I had private lessons for about six years. And then I thought, I want to go a step further. I want to train to be a teacher. Um, so yeah, it was a process of getting gradually hooked by sort of by chance from the mm -hmm. from. The, mm -hmm. you know. Was it similar for you? Did you st sort of stumble across it? Uh, no, it was it was guitar craft. It was the oh, of course, of course. In my very first course with Robert Fripp, and uh, there was an Alexander Technique teacher there, the same lady that then I was in the band with, the Open String Choir, which was on on DGM. So, um, like, it's it's really it's really fascinating how. How these and you know it's 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 kind of magical. Like you know, Robert Fripp being into Alexander Technique and you being into Alexander Technique, you sending that recording, you responding. Like you know, we can always wonder. Like, is there like this an underlying theme, an underlying uh, vibration? You know what I mean? A vibe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that makes things like this happen. It is fascinating, um, and it's almost like we can observe these things taking place from the outside and and think that's an amazing story that's unfolding. <laughs> you know, it does feel sort of inevitable almost. Um, yeah. So um, to slowly come to an end. So the instrument you're. Uh, most specialized in is the Renaissance lute, you said, right? And Renaissance uh, being the, the the label for a certain period in really history. For the, yeah, for the 16th century. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How how would you describe that century and that music and the worldview and how? Yeah. Uh, well. To start with the music, <laughs> yeah. Uh, particularly the early 16th century, which is my main interest, um, the inspiration for all instrumentalists is the human voice. So, um, when you read 16th century books about how to play the, your instrument, it always says emulate the human voice. And a lot of what I play, of course, is vocal music originally, which has been arranged for the lute, sometimes by 16th century people, sometimes by me. Um, and all of the fantasies, you know, the contrapuntal things, things that would be later called fugues, mm -hmm. those are also entirely inspired by, by polyphonic vocal music of the time. So, 
so the this is a period when when the voice inspires all instrumental music and then by the time you get into the late 16th century music the 16th century music something big changed because it starts to be another element comes in which is the dance mm -hmm. so um by the time you get to late 16th early 17th century lute music a lot of it is is based on dance forms and that idea of polyphonic vocal qualities in the music starts to disappear um, and that's a fascinating process how and why it happened i don't know um, so that's the sort of musical century as it relates to the lute um, of course you still get vocal inspired counterpoint right through to well into bach even mm -hmm. but um well, the other the other thing that pervades that period, well, I can't avoid the fact that the lute is uh, an aristocratic instrument. It was played by rich people, mm -hmm. by dukes, kings, queens, um, people with money. It wasn't a, a common instrument. It was a it was an elite instrument, mm -hmm. um, and part of an, an education of a of a lady or a gentleman would be maybe to have some lessons on the lute. Um, so there's a very big, strong, hierarchical thing going on there, and um, and that that's certainly relevant to the, the instrument to the music. It's you might call it an aristocratic instrument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that pervades the six. Century Europe is, is religion, of course, and it's. I think it's hard for us to imagine. I mean, you'll know on my, my new album, all of the music started life as sacred music, um, and it's. I think it's hard for us to imagine what that actually means in the way it would have meant to someone in the 16th century. Religion is part of their lives in a way that it isn't for anybody today, it certainly isn't for me. But I could say when I'm playing that music, I almost become temporarily religious because it's so beautiful. I feel the music, you know. Um, so, so um, yeah, there's religion pervading society to such an extent that I think I'm going to imagine it's, it's central to people's lives. Um, and and that's the other sort of big theme I think that that we can't avoid. That we're playing this this music. Um, there's sacred music. There's secular music. It's interesting that the lute books and the lute manuscripts of the time have both, you know, sacred and non-sacred music, just together, mm -hmm. um, thrown together, in the same book. Um, it's 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 as though the sacred is inseparable from everything else. You know, mm -hmm. and I suppose that influences the way I think about, about my playing and about music and about my instrument, even though I'm not religious in the slightest, you know. Um, as for political history and war and turmoil and, you know, the Reformation and mm -hmm. Henry VIII and Martin Luther and so on, I'm no expert on all that stuff, but of course it's important. And the movement of, of composition, composers and musicians is important. Some of the most famous lute composers were played for the Pope. You know, they were the, in the personal employ of the Pope as the Pope's private musician. You know, or they worked for a king, and a composer like like Dowland, or even earlier, an Italian composer like Francesco da Milano. They traveled so much. Mm -hmm. Talk about slow travel. You mm -hmm. know, Francesco worked in France. He worked in what is now Italy. He turns up all over Europe um, and these people must have spent I mean it's hard to imagine how long it would have taken them to get from A to B mm -hmm. but um, this movement this free movement of, of music is fascinating to me all of that is how I would perhaps characterize that period wonderful the, the reason why I asked is because I believe that by by our interests, by our artistic uh, utterances, we kind of bring 
office to bring something to the world, and you are you're sort of like building a bridge to the 1600s by doing what you do. And I think it's it's extremely valuable. Like for me, like building the bridge from the past to the future is all the, also building the bridge to the future. Mm -hmm. Like it's 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 very important, and I, I find that this this connection to like you know like the word tradition can, can be like can have a bad taste for some people, but I think it's 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 a very very important and valuable thing in both the arts and sciences and and other fields and right? all all the fields history and um, you know. and um, I feel like we're we're living in really exceptional times. And I'm just wondering which label um, future human beings will use for this and last century. Yeah, I wonder too. <laughs> it's, this is something we, we may not live to find out. <laughs> no, no. But, um, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned the bridges because, um, because that's exactly how I think about it. But I also think that one of the reasons I so much love to, um, to improvise with other musicians or specifically to seek out musicians from other traditions and work with them and learn from them is, again, the idea of bridges. You know, mm -hmm. studying early music is a bridge to the past. Studying music from other cultures is a bridge through the present to another, another reality. Mm -hmm. And there isn't, to me, much difference between those two. Uh, they're they're two different kinds of bridges, but they're both they're both kind of seeking the same thing. It's sort of like seeking understanding, isn't it? Yes. It's, I'm 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 through my music. I'm seeking an understanding of a, a faraway time uh, through playing with, say, a, a Middle Eastern musician or a jazz musician or something. I'm I'm seeking an understanding of another way of being. And both of those things are terribly important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, uh, the word principles comes to my mind now when I when I hear you say that that like this, this by studying by studying the past, let's say, or or by building these bridges, we discover the the the, co the commonalities. It's sort of like it's the study of of things that are just there, like what we could also call reality somehow and I find that's kind of like what what in a way we're contributing to uh, it's maybe a you know a high like too too out there word to describe it but I think it's some sort of reality that we're uncovering as we as we're building these bridges you know yeah yeah I like that <laughs> <laughs> I like that too so uh, <laughs> Uh, I think we've uh, we've talked about uh, I don't know like an hour and forty two minutes or something. So um, and I could go on forever with you. And I'm really happy that we made the first step in uh, community communicating more directly. Yeah. And and uh, let's let's play together. Yes. Let's improvise together. Let's I not e let's not, let's not even wait for the composi composition to be written down. Let's just play together when whenever we get a chance. Let's get together and play and make music and record. Absolutely. I would love that. I would love that. Yes. Let's, it, it will happen. I'm sure it will happen. Yes, it will happen. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. Jacob, thank you so much. Um, goodbye for now. Uh, I'll stop the recording and we can, we can just talk a little bit more. Just a second.